Dear colleagues, good morning. This morning we have with us today the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, Mr. Xavier Bettel. Prime Minister Dear Xavier, welcome to the European Parliament and thank you for accepting our invitation to be part of our This is Europe series of debates. I take this opportunity to thank you and the people of Luxembourg for your belief, steadfast belief in Europe and your resounding commitment to our shared values, for your leadership in pushing our project forward and for showing that the limitations of geography are no limits to the potential of a people. We will not forget your unwavering support for Ukraine, for welcoming displaced Ukrainians in your homes, in your schools and communes, and for earmarking almost one-fifth of your defence budget to help Ukraine defend itself against the Russian invasion. Allow me to praise you, Prime Minister, for your strong position on holding perpetrators of war crimes to justice. The European Parliament will always push for peace, a real peace, with justice and accountability. And we know that for there to be a peace, there must be a Ukraine. As your government said in a statement earlier this year, Luxembourg will never resign itself to a world in which force prevails over law. And that is why we have also been able to count on Luxembourg to show firm support for Ukraine on its path to EU membership. For this Prime Minister and for so much more, I would like to thank you and assure you that this Parliament will continue to stand for these causes and for our common values with Luxembourg and with you. So, Monsieur le Premier Ministre, cher Xavier, la parole est à vous. Merci. Prime Minister, Xavier, you have the floor. Madame la Présidente, chère... Madame President, dear members of the European Parliament, what a privilege it is to be with you again in this uh, assembly. And I'm extremely grateful to the President for having invited me, and I uh, salute the uh, presence of the Commissioner as well. For me, this, is the, this house is the epicenter of European democracy, and uh, for 70 years my country has hosted the, this institution's secretariat. Back in 2018, when I addressed the house, there were some existential uh, doubts uh, in the European Union to do with uh, the Euro crisis, the migration uh, pressure in 2015. And this had divided the member states and divided this house. In 2016, there was the referendum in the UK, and a number of member states saw a rise in nationalism and identity movements, and there was talk of the end of the Union, there was talk of uh, various member states uh, leaving and the fact that uh, there was nothing that we could do about it. And now, in 2023, it's a pleasure to see that all that has not happened. In the last uh, five years, we have seen deeper crises than that of 2018, and we have risen to the challenge, including, Madam President, your own uh, institution. We have shown solidarity with Ireland following Brexit. We've preserved the integrity of the internal market. After some initial hiccups with uh, COVID, we have managed to guarantee the free movement of people and goods and we worked hard to limit the damage. Luxembourg is a country where we cannot close the borders because if we did, we wouldn't have anyone working in the hospitals. We have 
200,000 cross-border workers. It's unthinkable uh, to close the borders, and it's daft to think that you can stop a virus by closing borders. Imagine if uh, whatever happened with, uh, with the individual contracts, imagine if we had left uh, vaccines, uh, vaccine procurement to the free market. Luxembourg uh, wouldn't have been able to uh, afford them. And it's thanks to the Commission, it's thanks to the common uh, uh, collective for purchasing that it didn't matter whether you were uh, Luxembourg, uh, Maltese, uh, or, or whoever, you were able to have access to the vaccine. It's very easy to forget all that. Nous avons aussi, uh... We also uh, have common debt uh, issuance through Next Generation EU. And without this house, we wouldn't have a conditionality uh, mechanism. Uh, on respect for the uh, rule of law and then support for Ukraine, uh, the provision of uh, humanitarian and military assistance and the reception of uh, refugees in Europe has made us a credible geopolitical player. And then, of course, the climate crisis, which should not be overlooked, and the energy crisis. We've managed to reduce our consumption and we are moving towards uh, renewables uh, over fossil fuels. This is all about uh, the legacy that we are going to leave to our children. If we want future generations to enjoy our quality of life, then these are choices that we have to make. And I, I'd like to salute the leadership of this House in uh, the debate about climate change. You are elected by the citizens. You represent the citizens. And I have been... Uh, uh, presenting the uh, findings of a uh, survey which has revealed that the citizens whom we so often uh, think are uh, a bit skeptical about climate change actually want to go further than us. These are ideas from the grassroots to uh, drive policy. Why should, we, why should we be afraid of the citizens just because of five-year electoral cycles? Even if uh, uh, we have to stand for uh, uh, election, we should uh, allow the people to speak their views. And I think we'd be surprised sometimes at uh, the, the enthusiasm and the ideas that can uh, emanate from them. We should not be shy in this respect. I want to emphasize the need to uh, remain open. Our union should remain open to the world. Protectionism is an easy uh, reflex. I want to say something about European values, and fundamental rights and the need for our union to rise to the challenge presented by the war on our borders. During the pandemic, I said that uh, we had uh, demonstrated unity. Little Luxembourg took in French patients during the pandemic, thanks to the cross-border workers, we were able also to bring in patients from France. That's the European Union. The European Union is not about slamming the door and saying uh, everyone looks after their own. We need common uh, solutions. We cannot uh, achieve much alone. 
So it's very important for me to see in the future uh, I have to say I'm from a generation that uh, doesn't remember a war. Many, many of our uh, electorate remember the Iron Curtain. They remember division. And do we in the European Union of today want to send a message that we want more walls? Europe is about bringing down walls and barriers. We shouldn't make the mistakes of the past, Madam President. We also need an, uh, the uh, single market. 56 million jobs have been created uh, in uh, the European Union thanks to the single market, according to the European Parliamentary Research Service. I mean, great things have been achieved in consumer protection and food safety. And uh, it is uh, the single market that will enable us to remain competitive at a global level. However, the single market is not enough. We need to be open to the rest of the world in terms of investment flows, and the EU needs to defend itself against uh, uh, pr protectionism and uh, against um, certain types of investment. It's very important for there to be strategic autonomy. But let me explain what strategic autonomy is. It is not protectionism. It is not uh, uh, lifting the drawbridge. And it's not keeping distance from the rest of the world. We should concentrate on outcomes rather than a fanciful debate. The Net Zero Industry Act, the CHIPS Act, and the Critical Materials Act, the Commission has done its bit. Luxembourg considers openness as fundamental to strategic autonomy open markets, a level playing field, and climate and human rights issues will always be part of our prosperity. Protectionism, protectionism makes you poorer, uh, and it also ultimately makes you dependent. On the other hand, strategic autonomy means diversification of supply chains. It means uh, cooperating with those who share our values, uh, including meeting the objectives of the Paris Accord. Strategic autonomy also means protect, uh, proactive industrial policy in order to keep manufacturing in Europe. It is important to secure um, uh, the supply of critical raw materials and to diversify. It's important to end dependence on uh, fossil fuels and to promote uh, the uh, generation of uh, renewable energy, uh, hydrogen, and so on. Technology and innovation are essential, and hence I talk in terms of open strategic autonomy. And when I'm talking about openness, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot avoid touching upon the issue of a truly common European migration policy. I agree that in order to Schengen to work, we need to be in a position to better regulate and control access to the Schengen area. However, for me, that does not and can in no way imply that we Europeans do not have a legal obligation and a moral duty to offer those who seek international protection a realistic possibility to do so and to grant international protection to those who qualify for it. Uh, as I as I have told my colleagues at the February European Council, border walls are not only costly and questionable from a political point of view, but they are not 
effective in stopping irregular migration. We have to improve the surveillance of our external borders and engage with international partners on issues like returns or the management of migratory flows or addressing the root causes of irregular migration and setting up possibilities for regular migration. At the same time, the respect for fundamental rights as well as international humanitarian law should be the guiding principle for common European migration policy that preserves and strengthens our credibility with our neighbours and other third-party countries. The external dimension can, however, only be complementary to the internal dimension. A common European migration policy needs to be fair, resilient, rules-based and characterised by the right balance between solidarity and responsibility. For me, the European Asylum and Migration Pact and the related preparatory work by the successive French, Czech, and Swedish presidencies represents the only solution on the table which the potential to achieve this balance. Let us not give up the pact and let us try to hammer out an agreement before the end of this legislature using the joint roadmap of the European Parliament and the Council as our compass to this end. For me, one of the central characteristics of the European project has been the fact that it's always been solidly ensured in the respect for fundamental rights and rule of law. This has been my main theme of the, my speech before this plenary last November. And as I told in the press conference, I had a prepared speech about technical and secretariat, etc., etc., etc. But Roberta, you showed us the video of Simon Weil. And this changed my whole speech. Simon Weil, for the, for, you know who was Simon Weil, but we are celebrating, not celebrating, remembering today. You have this yellow star on you. Simon Weil had not only a yellow star or flower, <laughs> she was marked for life. She was Jewish. She fought during her political engagement for women's rights. And for me, she represents Europe. This peace project, this project of respecting people how they are. And so that is the reason that I want to excuse officially to all my team who prepares usually long speeches, and I don't very often stick to them. But it was for me important to remind it. And for me, you have to continue to fight for these rights, for this rule of law, and for these human rights. La défense de l'état de droit, Madame la Présidente, et defense of the rule of law and fundamental rights of citizens has to be the uh, foundation stone of this uh, European Union. We cannot change the rules according to who is in power. And I want to salute the European Parliament's role in the introduction of uh, the conditionality clause for multi-annual financing and next generation EU. Uh, for certain national recovery plans, the uh, funds have been uh, suspended um, and there are uh, procedures being taken against the LGBT plus uh, uh, law in Hungary. And there are 15 member states supporting the Commission. And Orban wanted a law which would uh, prevent people talking about homosexuality in the media. Uh, if there's anyone in this house who thinks that you become a homosexual by watching the television or listening to a song, then you've not understood anything. The most difficult for a homosexual is to accept themselves. On demande pas de pitié. On de Nobody's asking for pity or solidarity or compassion. Just respect. Just respect. There is no point in having a double life or a secret life. Do you know how many young people commit suicide because they are unable to communicate their homosexuality. It is appalling to uh, 
think that you can deal with this by a law on the media. When I accepted this, my family said, finally, my friends said, finally. But the idea that in another country I couldn't say this because I could end up in prison, I could uh, lose my life, the idea that in a European Union member state I could only talk about this in secret. Uh, I understand that there are people who want to win votes at the expense of minorities. We've had that before in our history. Madam President, I think uh, that uh, we can add some tools to our box in terms of the rights of minorities. And I will be asking in future for more solidarity for our, to meet our climate goals, industrial policy goals. And Madam President, allow me to conclude by saying something about this war, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, which uh, has been taking place on our borders for the past year. Many people thought uh, that uh, the European Union would not be united, and yet it is. The European Union is never strong when it is not united. Its member states alone cannot achieve much, but the European Union, when it is united, can achieve a great deal. I uh, don't see an end to this any time soon. The United Nations Charter is being violated. Luxembourg, as you said, Madam President, does not accept uh, impunity. Robert Schuman of Luxembourg in 1950 said that world peace can only be achieved uh, by uh, peace efforts commensurate to the threats we face. And it is really up to us to uh, act uh, united against Russian aggression, penalize the aggressor, and support Ukraine financially, deliver arms to Ukraine. As you said, we have devoted a big chunk of our budget to Ukraine to uh, enable it to defend itself. And we need uh, creative efforts in terms of enlargement as a geopolitical tool, help Ukraine on its way to accession. We need to ensure that the European Union can work as a, as a bigger union in terms of its budget and finances. And we will need to mobilize the resources to rebuild Ukraine and to stop a war on our continent once and for all. We must not disappoint our citizens. We have to ensure that the rule of law is respected. We have to meet our climate objectives. We have to deliver to Ukraine. And we have to complete this process of building something together which is going to enable us to achieve something. Uh, as I think it was Churchill who said that uh, alone we can move faster, but uh, together we can move further. And had it not been for Europe as a Prime Minister of Luxembourg, I might not be in a position uh, here to uh, address you. And there uh, those of you, uh, th there are many of you here who, who argue and, and fight, but you don't use weapons, you use words, and that's how it should be. And we certainly should not fall prey to populism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. To the colleagues, um, uh, starting with the representatives of the political groups, I ask you all to stick to your allotted time, starting with the EPP group, Isabel Vislelima. 
Monsieur le Premier ministre. Thank you. Prime Minister, the European Union, and with Luxembourg at its heart, still attracts many, many people. And this is one of its strengths. But the European Union is equally at a crossroads. We need more Europe in, in order to be able to face up to a world which has become increasingly hostile to democracy and which has indeed seen the return of war to our co continent, thanks to the autocratic and hegemonic tendencies of Russia, which has invaded Ukraine. We need more Europe and more autonomy, not least vis-à-vis -vis China. The COVID pandemic has shown the citizens of Europe that what the European Union can do. And there is now an awareness of the importance of the health union. And I'd like to thank the Prime Minister of Luxembourg for highlighting this. The COVID has, uh, pandemic also showed us what shortages and supply chain problems meant in terms of food, medicines or vital technology. We can, must no longer depend on other continents. We need to be self-reliant and we need to be reshoring our production in Luxembourg too. This is the way we can guarantee our future. European defence is absolutely imperative. We need to have a military which can take autonomous decisions effectively. We must be aware that dependence in energy sources, economically or militarily, makes us weaker. We must therefore strengthen the autonomy of decision making and our autonomy de facto. This is what will provide our strength. This will bring us closer to peace and to having this strong European Union to which we all aspire. Thank you. I give the floor now to the president of the SND Group, Irache Garcia Perez. Gracias. Thank you very much, Madam President. Mr. Bettel, welcome to the European Parliament. You have come here to this House as a representative of Luxembourg, a country that has always been at the forefront of European integration. More than seven decades after Luxembourg laid the groundwork for Benelux, our European Union faces a sea change, one of the biggest changes in its history. Mr. Bettel, as you said in your speech, the time has come to decide how we want to continue building Europe. And I'm going to add something to that. Also, we have to decide with whom we want to continue building Europe. The latest events that have unfolded have shown us that uh, we're at a moment when some are shifting away from moderation and are going towards hate policies against women, scientists, uh, LGTBI and others and this is jeopardizing what we have achieved. Uh, and, uh, Mrs. Meloni in Italy is clamping down on the rights of LGBTI people when it comes to the registration of uh, children of same-sex couples uh, and is also trying to take away any protection of immigrants. There's another huge challenge, uh, climate change, uh, the Partido Popular and Vox from the far right in Spain are jeopardizing the future of the Jew in our crown, the Doñana National Park. And the vice president of my region, Castilian Leon, says that we should uh, leave children in peace and that they will decide when they become adults whether CO2 is a pollutant or not. So that is why we have to decide on which side of history we want to be. Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the war uh, uh, waged by Putin in Ukraine, uh, people are trying to uh, have a, get a decent job, uh, make ends meet, make sure their uh, children uh, get a decent education, they can buy a house, but at the same time, uh, there are more and more millionaires. How can we ask citizens to resist if they, these companies aren't paying taxes? So, Mr. Betel, we need to commit to a fair tax policy. Social Democrats know which way they're heading. We want to come up with answers to these huge challenges. We want to protect uh, the rule of law in order to make sure that minorities aren't attacked. Uh, the time has come to commit to these causes. I'd like to thank those who uh, uh, helped me uh, 
um, write these wonderful speeches, and at the end, I was going to say, which side uh, do you want to be? But uh, having heard your speech, I don't need to ask you this question. So I'm going to thank you very much for your commitment. Thank you very much for being committed to building a more social, fair, and more egalitarian Europe. Thank you very much. Next is the president of the Renew Group, Stéphane Sejournet, for two minutes. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you very much, President. It is a genuine pleasure to be able to welcome the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, Xavier Bettel, to our hemicycle. For a number of years now, it is absolutely the case that you have been in the forefront of our quest to build Europe, and certainly in relation to your size, you have contributed a disproportionately large amount to our structures, to our work, to our achievements. And there are many steps which we wouldn't have achieved even yet without your input. I'd like to say, Prime Minister, that you personally have remained absolutely true to this historic legacy of your country, which you've defended in the Council very robustly. And as you've said, before the European Parliament, both previously and today, you continue to take forward these objectives. We stand with you. We feel that conditionality, the defence of the rule of law, the Green Deal, European sovereignty are of paramount importance. All these points you've raised with us this morning. Therefore, we stand with you. And indeed, a large number of colleagues right across the hemicycle would join with you and myself in denouncing Viktor Orban's populist tendencies and statements and actions. It is vital that liberal democracies stand together and stand up for what we believe. European Union is the cradle and the key of liberal democracy. It may have imperfections, we're well aware of that, but in terms of decision-making and standing up for individuals, this is the way we wish to move forward, and this is clear from the way the Council operates. Europe has shown that it can be flexible, and this is important. You've talked about the constitutional approach to the structures that we've faced. We've had economic crisis, COVID, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and we've stood together with determination and resolve both within the Parliament and in other institutions. And our solidarity has established a very strong, robust basis for our action. Of course, economic, geopolitical and climate challenges are there on the very immediate horizon. And we need to address those too. I shall conclude in just a moment, um, Madam President. Of course, we are moving towards the elections, transnational lists, are an important consideration. The right of initiative for the Parliament is very important. And I know, Prime Minister, that you're taking forward these principles of ours. Thank you very much for standing up for your values and th through that, through many of ours. And I know that you can count on, that we can count on you on taking forward what the developments we need to see in the European institutional structure. Thank you. Co President of the Green Group, Philip Lamberts. Moyen, Levin Premier Minister, Levin Xavier, Moyen and bienvenue. bienvenue. Moyen and welcome. I'm very moved because I have a soft spot for the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. In my previous life, for 10 years, I was a business uh, uh, rep uh, and my main partner was in Colmarberg. You probably can a guess, and I was see, seen as a Belgian. No, it wasn't the Grand Duke, uh, just next door. But it's a real pleasure, it's a real pleasure to have you here and to hear this triple plea, first of all, for the EU. For small countries such as ours, it's obvious that sovereignty in the 21st century can only be built together. But as your predecessor said, and he then uh, became president of the Commission, Mr. Juncker, there are two kinds of countries, small countries, and then those countries that haven't realized yet that they are small. 
So that is why I'm very pleased that un the union and unity prevailed over the pandemic and the war. This is what makes us strong. But this union isn't any union. As you said, this is a union based on values. I will never forget the compass that Article 2 of the treaties is. It lists the values that underpin the EU, starting with uh, respecting human dignity. Not the dignity of European citizens, but human dignity. Uh, it doesn't matter what uh, gender, sexual orientation, beliefs. A human being is a human being and has to be respected. And uh, what you said in your speech was particularly moving. I'm glad that I can count on you to defend these values in the Council. It shouldn't be something extraordinary, but I have seen that in the Council it, this is not shared unanimously. So to have uh, uh, vital EU value champions in the Council will play a key role. There was also a plea for climate transition. If you look at the 27 heads of state and government, who is really the champion of the Green Deal? Who is a staunch proponent? But apart from you, I can't really see who else. Who really understands what a key challenge this is and how important this is for our future? Our future, because the planet might become inhabitable and it's vital also for our economic development. So our two political families are working together in the Luxembourg government. And I hope this will continue. Let us hope that this continues. I'd like to thank you for everything. Please continue. Don't give up. Uh, we stand by your side because we defend the same principles. Thank you. So do la parola al president. Thank you very much. I'm now going to give the floor to the leader of the ECR, Mr. Nicola Procaccini. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you very much, President. Prime Minister, welcome. The wonderful castles of Luxembourg bring to mind the history of our continent, a history which goes back thousands of years and which created a civilization which we are very proud of, which we love, and which we're de determined to preserve. I'm not saying anything new to you in saying this. Luxembourg is famous for many things. It's also famous, inter alia, for uh, aggressive tax planning, whereby many companies simply can evade payment of tax, and this in turn generates unfair competition within the borders of the European Union. I am convinced that if we want to have proper economic development and we want to be able to develop our economy as we wish, we're going to have to diversify from finance and manage taxes properly. Of course, Luxembourg also is home to Schengen, the place where the internal borders of the European Union began to be dismantled and where free movement became a reality. But of course, the paradox today is that internal freedom of movement is not really as free as external movement is. And it is also true to say that we ha are putting up borders within our union in order to stop movement of migrants from one country to another within the European Union, for example, France to Italy. And at the self same time, we're saying that we're leaving the borders open to illegal immigration, which means that the countries of first arrival simply turning into huge refugee camps with vast flows of people coming in. Many criticisms are levelled at the countries of first arrival. They're often told that they're not sufficiently welcoming, that they are not dealing with the immigrants in an appropriate way. But when an immigrant arrives, if they are actually stopped on a secondary border, they're simply returned unceremoniously to the country of departure. And this is absolutely hypocritical. And we've been denouncing this roundly for some time. We need to be much more focused, but we need to have a more humane approach at the same time. And the Conservatives are aware of the importance of our history and the history which brings us together. And this is why we agree with so much with the Luxembourg motto, which is that we want to remain that which we are. Thank you. Or to the representative of the ID group, Harald Wilimski, for two and a half minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. 
Thank you very much, Madam President. Ladies and gentlemen, well, it's uh, difficult to come to the uh, speaker's podium uh, when there has been a great deal of praise. But the two major groups in this House are stuck in a major problem. Look at the uh, Social Democrats. There's uh, their uh, uh, cash uh, suitcases found and being confiscated by the police. And then the other major group, the European People's Party, the European public prosecutor is currently... Uh, investigating the coronavirus uh, vaccine procurement. So it's time for a little bit of reflection and to think about ourselves. Let's try and not uh, just try and laugh this off. When there are important decisions to be taken, we have to try and take the right path. But in every single case, we've taken the wrong turning. It went back, to, uh, started in 2016 when the British said, thanks, but no thanks, we're going. That's when you should have started giving more competences to the member states. You should have treated them with respect and dignity when they decided to leave, and uh, that is something that we failed to do. Same happened with the migration crisis in 2015, which to date has still not been uh, done correctly. We've been taking the wrong decisions. Not just labour market problems, social problems, uh, migration problems. These are not the only problems that are facing our continent. We face terror and crime on this continent. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll remind you, Brussels, the capital of Europe, where there were explosions at the airport, more than 30 died there. In Strasbourg, at the Christmas market a couple of years ago, that was an Islamist attack. Same in Paris and the Bataclan attacks. Can't you remember these attacks? Draw the right conclusions from the mistaken policies of the past. And on the coronavirus crisis, you simply borrowed uh, the idea of a free Europe when we went for policies of uh, lockdown, bankruptcies, psychic pro uh, psychological problems in, among our population. And as we know now, all of this was totally unnecessary. I can give you plenty more examples. Same on the issue of Ukraine and Russia, the wrong decisions. Instead, we're uh, feeding this war and saber-rattling. So now we're going to be eating insects. Is that the next thing? Is that what the European Union is concentrating on? I give the floor now to Ms. Manon Aubry as co-president of the left group. Ms. Aubry, please come. Mr. Wilimski, your time is up. Go ahead, Ms. Aubry. Monsieur Bettel. Mr. Bettel, I have something for you. What is, is common between uh, Tiger Woods, Brad Pitt, Pitts, the MS Fati, the uh, prince of uh, Saudi Arabia, Bernardo, um, and the Italian market and others, they have uh, a great passion for your country, Luxembourg. Um, there are good things uh, in your country, as you say. But actually, the reality is that uh, you see people domiciled here, for example, uh, in the Jeanne Rupert uh, Road. Uh, it's an ordinary building that I'm showing you here. In that building, you find 1,810 companies which uh, just happen to share these offices. So could you tell, uh, tell us by what miracle uh, um, Luxembourg um, escapes the laws of physics? As you know, the, after all these scandals, you see find these companies which are just letterbox companies, and the only role is to avoid tax evasion on a major scale. The reality, Mr. Bettel, that, that you're the head of a tax haven at the heart of Europe, a, a organized uh, robbery, and nobody can or uh, wants to uh, 
uh, control it. You talk about uh, frontiers, uh, I agree, but when it talked about the r money of the rich or the multinationals, uh, there's a one-way street, and in Luxembourg, um, it never ends. And it's um, uh, pensions and social services that suffer. Uh, cuts are being made, and and uh, you don't try to recoup the, recoup the money from tax evasion. You talk about a Europe and of cooperation and solidarity. Um, but some of the, the shells are as empty as uh, some of the companies that, uh, are, that reside in your country. Thank you, President. Dear Mr. Bettel, you told in your speech about the rule of law in the European Union. But do you agree that the rule of law toolbox recently introduced is not working. By my opinion, just disappearance of the resolutions of rule of law in Spain, Malta, and Greece in this plenary is approval of this fact. We commemorate today the appraisal in Warsaw Ghetto. My great parents were thrown to Riga Ghetto. I am from Latvia and then killed. Therefore, for me, a problem of big concern is the growing number of political prisoners in Baltic states. In my state, Latvia, a series of trials of 14 journalists has been started yesterday, last week. Just they are accused of violating of sanctions, EU sanctions, and uh, facing up to four years in prison. Thank you very in much. Neighboring Lithuania, Your time is up. another journalist is imprisoned for six okay. years. The same happens in Estonia. Okay, thank you very much. Your time is up. Thank you, Ms. Danuka. I give the floor next to Paolo Rangel for one and a half minutes. Dear President, dear Prime Minister, Commissioner, First, let me uh, thank you and congratulate you uh, for reinforcing the tradition of Luxembourg commissioners, presidents of commission and prime ministers in fighting for rule of law, for human rights, for the rights of minorities. Uh, because I remember that even uh, against uh, the first steps of uh, wrongdoing of Orban, Vivian Reding was always with the uh, red alarm, and not by chance, Juncker was not voted by Orban as president of the Commission. And so this is Luxembourg is always giving the example, and you keep this tradition and reinforce it. Then let me say, as a Portuguese, that we experienced the European Union before we, we were members because of the experience of our citizens in Luxembourg. They were so well received uh, uh, that this was the true European spirit. And then let me uh, put a political question. Because at some time, at some moment, you said that peace could be obtained in Ukraine if there was a meeting between Xi Jinping and Biden. And I have to say that I'm quite uh, sceptical about this statement. And I'd like to know uh, how do you uh, envisage a peace process when you uh, uh, try to design this uh, new formulation. Because I see with President Lula now what he is saying. And these are not good news for us and not good news for Brazilian external policy. Thank so I'd like your comment on this. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. President. Angel. I give the floor next to Vice President Marc Angel for two minutes. Prime Minister, I remember our shared time in Luxembourg policies, sometimes in the same coalition, sometimes shared by the balance of power in politics. Uh, we always wanted to uh, improve people's lives. Thank you for being here. I'm proud that Luxembourg, a founder member, has always proposed, uh, supported uh, the European um, project and has been in favour of uh, integration despite being small. 
Prime Minister, solidarity, rule of law and fundamental values are more important than ever in a changing world. I'm counting on you to continue to defend our principles in Europe elsewhere, as you've always done. The European population deserves our full solidarity in its fight against the Russian aggressor and in defending our values. It is essential, as you said, to preserve European unity on this issue. Solidarity also requires a determined fight against social inequality. The deepening of the social dimension in Europe, which has been called for from this, by the citizens in the Conference on the Future of Europe, is, this is crucial. And this exercise of the conference was an excellent uh, exercise where we had thousands of citizens involved. European, citizen, European solidarity is also about tax questions. I welcome the reforms for put in place in the last de decade in Luxembourg and the EU. I hope that this will be uh, maintained. We should extend our solidarity towards those who are fleeing war and perse persecution. My group, the S&D, is happy that Luxembourg continues, continues to defend a humane position in a debate where, the, where the, um, with a harsh tone in the Council, it's important to find an agreement on the migration pact before the European elections. Prime Minister, the EU has ambitious objectives in terms of uh, fighting climate change, digitalization or defense. And for that, it has to be uh, renewed, um, adapt its rules, its uh, economic and social governance, redefine uh, the, the framework of b budget resource and, uh, if necessary, modify treaties. I hope that Luxembourg will be prepared to uh, maintain an ambitious approach to the European project. Run for two minutes. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, allow me to start by uh, quoting our friend Philippe Lambert. I want to uh, address a very warm Guy Morgan to you and your team. Now, in a small country where we seem to have uh, a China-USA conflict, where we have a geopol tense geopolitical situation, but a small country has to find its place in a world where firepower and uh, intimidation seem to be uh, the uh, common currency. No, a country isn't virtuous just because it's small. A country isn't necessarily an example because it doesn't have the means to crush its neighbours. But a small country can be useful, if not very useful, because it knows how to catch, at an early stage, the existential crises that uh, can be faced by uh, other countries. So a prime minister of a small country knows what he's talking about when he tries to convince others that are all larger than his country why European integration is indispensable. Like his fellow citizens, he feels the need to unite, to cooperate, to mutualize the affairs of the 27 member states and to alert partners to the consequences of their actions and the consequences of non-Europe. So European integration, is that just an answer to some of the problems? No, it is the answer. Robert Schuman, who was the, uh, uh, the foreign minister of a large country, spent his uh, early years in my country and we can think of predecessors like Santerre, Juncker, Thorn and Bannon. They all understood in this privileged manner why it's important to have rights and not just force. The balance of power is one in which we need to call upon those who are larger so that we can speak with a single voice outside Europe. Dear Prime Minister, dear Xavier, it's always a, a pleasure to see you in the European Parliament. Historically, and today still, Luxembourg is at the heart of the European project, and we uh, pay tribute to our role as one of the three European capitals. In our Union of 27, even a small country like ours has its place in the negotiations and can change things. I'm, sh of course, uh, proud of the uh, commitment of the Luxembourg government against nuclear 
which, as we agree, is neither green, neither safe, neither renew renewable. So thank you for giving your clear support um, and the support of the Energy Minister, Cla Claude Tormes, and against taxonomy. Taxonomy. Well, let's talk about finance. As one of the uh, sites of the three largest European financial markets, we have a particular responsibility to put in place the ecological transition and promote social justice also beyond the Union. That's why I would like Luxembourg to play a precursor role when it comes to uh, due diligence of companies. Is Luxembourg, will Luxembourg, Luxembourg finally support the financial sector being included in this directive? The directi directive is rightly an opportunity for Luxembourg to clear position itself clearly as a leader in terms of truly sustainable financing, financing which respects human rights and environmental uh, concerns. To Mr. Buxa de Villalba for one minute. Gracias, President. Thank you very much, uh, President. Prime Minister Betel, one of the founding niches of the community. Of course, Europe is made of, of its parts, and its parts cannot be sequestered by a globalist agenda. Europe is a space of liberty, uh, protecting those that are vulnerable, protecting the rights of Europeans, a space of security, not a place where borders are violated. Europe is that effort to continually improve uh, living conditions, uh, protect and promote development, and not those particular policies which mutilate uh, uh, the structure, the crystal that we have created. Uh, looking at Italy, Hungary, uh, numerous other countries as well, which are trying to somehow protect the, the European Union from the entry of products, illicit products as well. So we have to protect the freedoms, the fundamental liberties of all citizens, and that is our main task, and we are guardians of that. Herr Premier Minister. Prime Minister, uh, the migrant crisis is, uh, is again out of control. We can see uh, women, men and children uh, drowning in the Mediterranean every day. We can see time and again that uh, human smugglers and despots in Turkey, in North Africa, are getting richer and richer. And we can see that the cultural impact on the European continent and so many welfare migrants, and most of them coming to Europe are, if we look at the uh, asylum rights, the impact on the European populations, on uh, cohesion and uh, our sense of community. So in the Danish uh, People's Party and the ID group, we've had a solution which solves the problem. As you know, the Australian model, where they have a pushback and uh, asylum procedures are dealt with in three third countries, that would deal with uh, criminality, illegal immigration, and the uh, cultural impact it has on the European continent. We are happy in the Danish People's Party that the Danish government, which have uh, good colleagues like the, uh, the Social Democrats, the uh, uh, Venstre and uh, others in Renew, are uh, in favor of bringing in a sort of Australian model uh, in Europe. So we also hope that the Danish government's proposal uh, will advance in Council. We know how hopeless this Parliament is when it comes to tackling the true problems, when it comes to the challenges of m migration. The, the weakest uh, migrants, those who don't have, can't afford uh, human smugglers, they, who can't get through the desert, those who really need our protection, we le leave them behind in the camps. But the strong people, those who have funds, those who uh, uh, help uh, uh, human smugglers with their terrible business model, they get access to Europe. I hope that Luxembourg will wake up and follow the Danish example. The floor now to Mark Botenga for one and a half minutes. Prime Minister, welcome. Good morning. We belong to different political parties. I defend the working class. You're on the side of uh, tax evasion and the bankers. But 
I think that you have taught the European Commission and some of my colleagues a good lesson, and I'd like to thank you for that. The European Commission has talked about banning TikTok. TikTok collects data, well, no doubt about that. I've got no trust in that particular multinational. Google and Facebook are much better. I bought some shoes uh, the other day and I ended up with uh, my news thread full of adverts for new shoes. But the Commission is not calling for Facebook and Google to be banned. When the Commission is uh, trying to ban TikTok, they're baying the United States. Young people prefer TikTok to Facebook and all the others. The US would like us to only use American products they would like us to only consume American news to make us completely dependent upon them. From a perspective of European strategic autonomy, services like this have no place. Well, the Commission is saying you're not going to uh, ban TikTok just because it's Chinese. No, we need to protect our data uh, on all fronts. So, I mean... We don't need uh, Facebook to, to know exactly who's connecting to Wi-Fi. Luxemburg az európai közösség egyik alapítója. Luxemburg is is one of the founding countries of the European uh, Community. And it is, of course, it is an honor to be with Luxembourg together in this particular structure. But when from one of the founding countries uh, comes forth and when there is talk about hate, hate and about defining identities through your particular identity and uh, filtering everything from your, through your convictions and calling hate speech certain things that you define simply as such, that is unacceptable. I think it's very important for children uh, to be protected and that is why we have this particular piece of legislation in, p in place concerning uh, the dissemination of homosexuality because it is to protect children. But Luxembourg may be the most Euro-optimistic European state but after the unjust Schengen December decision Romania is the most uh, Euro-pessimistic. After being in the rank first five most, um, most uh, Euro-optimistic states, we can only expect uh, concern to grow in Bucharest. Romanians have been treated like a second-class European people after being handed out much lower agricultural subsidies. This is only an example, but the list is long. Um, I believe negotiations are happening behind closed doors over the heads of European citizens. In football, this is called uh, match uh, fixing. Who decides over Europeans' uh, heads and in their names that Schengen legislation must be blatantly ignored? If this were Germany or France or the Netherlands or Austria, would the situation be the same? Well, Romania is not a second-class country and it is coping with flying colors with the Putin-triggered geostrategic crisis. Uh, Ukrainian refugees found shelter in Romania before money being unlocked from um, uh, from the EU. Romania is Moldova's main uh, partner, um, helping it to withstand Putin's blackmail. We have to realize that uh, Moscow is applying the divida et impera principle. Uh, principle. If we don't uh, understand that, the price tag will be will be high. The European institution must treat citizens equally. They do not do that. I hear um, talks about uh, joint policies. There are fences being uh, put up inside the EU and Romanian transporters have to queue to pass uh, Schengen borders. Petel said the European Union is only strong if it is united. But um, this ship is about to become a shipwreck. 
Premier Minister Bettel. Prime Minister Bettel. Well, it was good to hear your uh, speech a year before the elections to the European Parliament. You don't fall into the traps of the populists. They're talking about self-reflection, but some of, the, some of the people in this room don't know how to spell it. I mean, we uh, did respond to COVID by closing borders and jointly procuring vaccines, but that allowed us to uh, succeed in the long term and we'll be better prepared for next time round. We shouldn't be afraid of citizens, of course. I, uh, you said that and I thought that was right. We had the Conference on the Future of Europe. I don't think anyone's afraid of the proposals of the citizens. Quite the contrary. We're in the process of implementing those proposals. But I think that in the Council, we need to dispel the fears of the citizens' ideas. We need a new convention to strengthen the heart of democracy. What's your assessment? Do you think we can get a majority for it? Two minutes. Thank you, Madam President. As I promised, I will stick to my two minutes. And Prime Minister, uh, great to be here with you and to discuss uh, Europe's issues. And I want to thank you for your great leadership. Uh, finally, we have the opportunity to speak in front of the full plenary in a couple of minutes uh, and to hear your final conclusions. Uh, the think tank of the Liberals overview this month is titled Facing a Perm Crisis to Remain the Same, the EU Needs to Change. I couldn't agree more. This impact of the coronavirus inflation crisis, energy crisis, certainly the war in Ukraine, only those events in the last three years are enough to shake up our perceptions of Europe of uh, tomorrow. Let me start by, uh, by uh, thanking you on your leadership on migration. You spoke at length about migration. After years of uh, deliberation, compromises, uh, redrafting, we need to make sure that we finally, we finally have a place where clear, fair and humane rules of migration uh, are, uh, are in place for Europe. Building higher walls only provides a false sense of uh, security. Another extremely important and long awaiting segment that finally needs to find resolution is achieving full integration of Europe. Better integrated single market capable to resist uh, the competitive uh, uh, distractions, strong and incompleted Eurozone. But most importantly, Schengen area. We simply cannot continue talking about equality in the Union if we don't have uh, all the member states uh, part of uh, Schengen area. And third necessary is to making a full use of rule of law uh, framework. Lastly, we cannot uh, punish the countries aspiring to join the European Union for our need of reforming its infrastructure. Europe is not complete without having uh, Balkans, and Europe is not going to be complete without having uh, Ukraine. Uh, together we can move forward with our friends and partners with allying uh, to the European uh, policies and thank you again for taking leadership on many of them. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuchuk. Now it's Rasmus Andresen for one minute. Prime Minister, in your last speech in Parliament a few months ago, you pointed out to us our common European historical heritage. You uh, re condemned fascism being um, normalized in Europe. Actually, today we have a fundamental discussion. In some member states, there are uh, alliances of party which have a fascist origin, who forget history and fight against democracy. They want a Europe of nations where only a few will profit and most will lose. They start with attacking minorities in the media, as we see in uh, Italy, where uh, uh, rainbow si families are being discriminated and there are uh, r ridiculous laws being brought in and reporters being put under pressure. Uh, it must be our joint democratic uh, job to fight this. So it's strange that Conservative and some Liberals are going into alliances with these parties. Thank you very much. Nick Tarczynski for one minute. Thank you, Madam President. This is very important debate about the future of Europe. This is very important debate, and I, I cannot hear the answer for the very fundamental question. What kind of future do you want for Europe? Do you want to build on the foundation of, of the European history, on Greek philosophers, Roman law, Christian culture, 
Or you want to continue with your politics which led us to no-go zones in Sweden, burning suburbs of Paris, terrorist attack in Germany and Spain. So maybe you should focus on legacy of John Paul II, Copernicus, Chopin. Maybe we should go back to the roots before we're going to discuss the future. So maybe you should be like Poland, with lowest unemployment in European Union. Thank you, Mr. Tarczynski. Maybe you would like to be number one as a safest place Thank in Europe. You. Thank so you. if you want to have a future for Europe, be Thank you. like Poland, because Poland is Thank future. Thank you. Your time is up. Next Thank is you. Jörg Moysen for one minute. Frau Präsidentin, Herr Premierminister. Madam President, Prime Minister, well, I must say that I have uh, a lot of respect for your speech. You, have, you spoke very freely. There are crises around the world, and these raise questions as to how Europe should behave in terms of foreign policy. The key issue is, how should the EU be structured to respond properly to these crises? The reflexive answer is more EU, more centralization, and an almost blind approach where we would really have a uh, real politic as the, what we should be aiming for, realism and pragmatism. The EU is a, a sick giant that is losing ground constantly. No one takes it seriously. Mrs. von der Leyen realized this in, in Beijing when she visited uh, last week. And the German foreign minister who's now making the country more and more ridiculous has done pretty much the same. We need a pragmatic foreign policy. We have to put an end to trying to give uh, moral preaching to other countries, uh, you, uh, constant European arrogance. Otherwise, we are going to make ourselves ridiculous at the international level. Mr. Ludgen, for one minute. Good morning, uh, Monsieur le Premier Ministre, cher Xavier. Good morning, uh, Prime Minister uh, Xavier. Congratulations of being in uh, defending European values, as Luxembourg does, and also defending minorities. But I think it's essential that you go for strategic autonomy. autonomy. We're, we're a, a solid type uh, for Europe, food, energy, defense especially, three sectors which are essential for the development of Europe as a whole. I listened to you, uh, Prime Minister. I'm, uh, I'm dis disappointed you d didn't talk about agricultural policy. How can we can succeed in climate change w without talking about farmers, those who uh, fight every day to f feed us? I think it's really important that, uh, on top of our values, we defend every European that uh, every European thinks European is an opportunity, and we've give all our support, that's where we should defend the European Union. Alex Jerusaliba for a minute. Thank you, Prime Minister, for being here with us so that uh, the European project is still relevant. We need to speak about the priorities of people, and one of the most important priorities that we all talk about is the priority to uh, strengthen the social uh, field, uh, especially when we have uh, um, uh, higher prices, we need to fight po po poverty, uh, and also the, the war in Ukraine. So the, it is important for us uh, that the principles of the European Pillar of Social Rights and the SDGs uh, should guide our reforms and investments. Social rights must have the same, must be as important as uh, uh, macroeconomic and environmental targets, and they should have the common goal of improving the well-being of our citizens. And I must also ask you what our priorities should be at the moment as Europeans also in the social field and also uh, uh, in, in, in the presence of our commissioner responsible for social matters. Thank you. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Monsieur le Premier Ministre, j'ai demandé d'intervenir dans ce débat parce que j'attends depuis cinq mois. I wanted to speak here because I would like to thank you on the uh, speech 
on the 70th anniversary of the European Parliament. You give, uh, hope, gave hope to a lot of us who are tired of heating, hearing from European leaders speeches uh, w which are standardized, which they could be written by the um, infamous chat GTP, GPT. You underlined the imp importance of respecting minorities, sexual, ethnic, religious, or politi political minorities for uh, peace and the future of Europe. I've ne never rarely heard such a conviction as you had. I ask you to continue and use your voice to point out to us, as you said, that uh, peace and uh, rights uh, can't be taken for granted and we should defend uh, these every day. Thank you. Floor next uh, to Siegfried Muresan for one minute. Thank you, Madam President. Prime Minister Bettel, thank you and many thanks to the people of Luxembourg for being excellent hosts to the European Parliament and to many institutions of the European Union for more than 70 years. The people of Luxembourg have always been at the forefront of European integration and at the forefront of defending European values. Let us stick together in defending Europe against extremism, against Euroscepticism, against division and against exclusion. Let us fight together for European values, for our democracy, for our institutions, for the values of the free world. And let me say that defending our European way of life requires efforts and sometimes it also requires costs. Safety, security and defence is something important to my political family, to the European People's Party and we have to work on this together. This is why my plea to you, Prime Minister Bettel, that Luxembourg increases also its commitment to safety, security and to defence spending as we have all agreed in NATO to, um, to allocate 2% of our GDP to defence. The people of Ukraine are fighting Thank for you. a European way of life. We should also defend our security here in Europe and at our borders. Thank Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Muresan. Adesso do la parola a Brando Benifei per un minuto. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you very much, President. Prime Minister Bettel, welcome back to the European Parliament. Your country, Luxembourg, has been central to the construction of European integration. Together with so many other countries, we have now become a major union. But we need more courage from your country and from others, from governments, from the Council. The 8th and 9th of May, on Europe Day, hundreds of thousands of people will be demonstrating here in Strasbourg. We'll be demonstrating everywhere in Europe, calling for a more united, more federal Europe. It's the younger generations that are calling for faster decisions without vetoes on social rights, climate rights, tax justice civil rights, institutional transformation in Europe to make it stronger. The Conference on the Future of Europe has sketched out the route to be followed. We now need a convention for the reform of the treaties so that we can have genuine European integration while respecting our differences. Let's not place a veto on the future of Europe's citizens. Let's listen to their demands for a more united Europe. The alternative is nationalism, and nationalism, as we know very well, always leads to war. Uh, Mr. Benifei, next is Lucas Furlas for one minute. I'd like to welcome you to the European Parliament. As a member of the European Parliament from a small country, from Cyprus, I would like to greet the leader of another small country which has provided so much to the European Union. What unifies us are principles and values. And we have to protect. We are the guardians of these values. I come once again from a small country, and I'd like to say that solidarity for us is translated into something which means basically our existence and nothing more. Uh, our, our existence is thanks to solidarity, and I'd like to thank all of those who have supported us with the Cyprus issue and with this very difficult period of occupation. We thank the, you and the position of your country on this particular issue. We don't want to fight by ourselves, but we have had to fight by ourselves on many occasions, and we haven't been able to provide some sort of closure to this terrible Cyprus situation. Once again, a small country's in the European Union, when working together, can achieve that cohesion and that strength which uh, Europe is ever so dependent on. Thank you very much.
Member to take the floor, Christophe Hansen, for one and a half minutes. Merci beaucoup, Madame. Thank you very much, Madam President, Prime Minister. It's a pleasure to see you for the third time in a year in this plenary. I think it's a proof of the respect that you have for our institution. It's not necessarily the same respect that have towards you and Luxembourg policies that are shared country. I regret that because we're here to discuss the future of the European Union. I think the uh, European uh, Recovery Plan has been one of the biggest deepenings of the 20th century, 21st century. My question is, what will be the next uh, step in uh, a even greater deepening, uh, which will be the next uh, deepening you see? A second question, which is very important for foreign policy and security policy, is the principle of unanimity, which I think is counterproductive. counterproductive. What is your opinion and what could be done to get rid of this system of unanimity. A third question having to do with you, you were talking about being close to citizens. If we talk about citizens, there is a pro problem, problem of representativeness and democracy. We had the system of Spitzenkandidaten that citizens are saying that they support it. What would be your position next year if we uh, come back to the uh, Spitzenkandidat uh, system, would you accept it? Floor, back to the Prime Minister to answer to the questions, quite a lot of them that have been made to you. Thank you. Madam President, uh, un grand merci tout d'abord. Je tiens à remercier tous les. Madam President, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of the speakers who have spoken in the debate. I don't know if Mrs. Aubry is still here. Is she there? Because Madame Aubry attacked my country, but I can remember a similar scenario a few years ago from the other extreme. I had a similar attack from Mrs. Le Pen. Mrs. Le Pen isn't here. Uh, uh, Mrs. Aubry uh, gave me a riddle. Well, I don't know. I think uh, he was repeating Mrs. Le Pen's argument since Madame Aubry. And it's not just the discourse. It's a, a question of her being absent. So I will send her my response in writing. Well, I've had quite a few questions aimed at me. So first of all, on tax transparency, I can tell you that in 2019, Luxembourg ratified the bilateral convention. We've uh, ratified the minimal taxation deal. We're part of the international tax reform efforts. Luxembourg is part of the solution to the problem of tax evasion and tax aggressive tax planning. For many years now, we have no longer been part of the problem. So uh, I think we really need to stress the changes that have been made in Luxembourg. A couple of other questions. I'll start with one of the later questions from Mrs. de Lutien on agriculture. Well, we've got to stop thinking that the economy, the environment and agriculture are three separate files. No, there are huge economic opportunities from uh, greening our environment. Do you really think that the economy, agriculture and the environment are contradictions and are mutually exclusive? No, we should see these areas as partners, not rivals. We need to have a functioning agricultural system. We know that we need to change our modes of production. Our consumers also expect us to do our job. They pay attention to what lands on their plate, and they need to ensure that the price is correct too. Price is important, but also quality. You can't say that farmers aren't doing their job. It is a professional group which is suffering from climate change. It's climate change that makes their fields uh, less fertile. So climate change uh, farming has to be seen together. There have been a number of different questions about what to do on the future of Europe, the conference on the future of Europe. The Commission is currently preparing legislative changes, and I think we need to encourage them. Personally, I suggest this isn't the moment in time to change the treaties. Why do I say that's my personal view? In some countries, you'll face referendums. We have to make progress. We have to make the right changes. But to do it at this moment in time, the danger is that we will prevent the kind of changes that we want to see. So 
let's do what we can without changing the treaties. Let's make the necessary uh, legislative proposals. We've also heard about transnational lists and Spitzenkandidaten. Well, yes, I think that it's a good idea that you can have candidates from 27 different countries because I think it's a bit of a shame when you have these spitzing candidates that were not uh, candidates you can actually vote for in every European country. So the parties should have to agree there would be a single list that would be presented in every country, 27 candidates on it. So then you can choose who you want to elect. So there'll be a national list but also a transnational list with 27 different candidates. And then we'd have a chance to actually elect a spitzing candidate. Otherwise, it's just going to be making little changes here and there, and I don't think it's going to be sufficient. As for Xi Jinping and uh, Joe Biden and the idea of them getting together to talk about peace, well, there are people dying every single day in Ukraine, every single day. The primary thing that would help Ukraine is a ceasefire. That's my intimate conviction. A ceasefire is the key if we want to end this bloodbath. So... That, well, okay, yes, I know I've been criticised for it, but at the very beginning, I took up contact with uh, President Zelensky and uh, tried to get in touch with Putin as well. I tried to see if there was any opportunity to find a solution. I gave up when I saw that there was no openness on the Russian side to find a peaceful solution to the conflict. And when I saw what happened in Bucha, I had no longer had the necessary respect to work with uh, the Russian side and find a solution that way. But what we've got now is we've got Russia on one side and Ukraine on the other. I'm strongly on the Ukrainian side, and I'm pleased that across our political parties that we're aware that if we have democracy on this continent, it's because at the time of the Second World War, there were other countries that supported us. A lot of people in, uh, in the United States did not know where my country was, but they are the countries that liberated us from fascism. And if the Americans had not come, we would not be a democracy today. We cannot accept that a larger country simply decides on the future of a neighbouring country. I think the, the two people who have the greatest amount of influence are the ones who would be able to create a ceasefire, and that is the Chinese president and President Biden. I've said it before and I'll say it again. As for Romania and Bulgaria, Luxembourg has never been against Romania and Bulgaria. I've never used national politics to uh, block access to Schengen for any country. On foreign policy, well, in our coalition agreement in Luxembourg, we do say that qualified majority voting could be a solution for, uh, for European foreign policy. Well, trade is also important to me. That's something that you also have on the agenda. I'm not asking uh, to basically endorse positions from around the house, but to say that one country is an example, we should follow that example. Well, we have to remember that Europe is 27 different countries, different values, different histories, different public opinions, different religions, different origins. There is not a single mold we can't force every country to be identical. That would be an end to diversity. Much. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Premier Ministre. Thank you very, very much, dear colleagues. Today, the European Parliament marks the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So I ask you now to view a short video that commemorates the events of the 19th of April, 1943, in Warsaw. We had already organized battle groups. We attacked the German columns that came into the ghetto. They had to retreat that day 
victory was ours. Forty uh, of us survived. The leader of the uprising and the whole command had committed suicide. Uh, we survived by escaping the ghetto through the sewers. We weren't stupid. We knew very well what we were up against. But it was a symbol, the symbol of resistance against fascism, against servitude. Dear colleagues, today we remember. We remember the 